Hi everyone, welcome to episode 133 of the Woolen Spinning Podcast. My name is Rachel. I can be found pretty much everywhere as Well for Pearls. And thank you so much for joining us today. I'm coming to you from just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada. And we actually have some sun outside. It's not warm and it's pretty gray, but we've got some blue sky and a little bit of brightness. So hopefully we'll be able to get outside later. We're, Mike and James are still sick. This is James's third day home from school. So um, I've had him here. So it, I've been a little bit delayed um, sending out welcome emails for Patreon because um, there's a couple of people that I haven't reached out to yet and um, I've been a little bit delayed in answering emails and messages and stuff so please um, accept my apologies it's been a little bit of an odd week back to sort of the routine after holiday break because I was expecting to have a few days to get caught up and that has not happened and now I have a sore throat today so fingers crossed that all the greens and um, all the kale and all the spinach and um just all the good food um, and lots of fluids can sort of keep me from actually getting sick. So um, I hope you are all well. Welcome to anybody who is new and just attending the live stream for the first time and welcome to anybody who is new and watching the podcast for the first time. Um, if this is your first time here, the podcast has just recently been um, started in terms of um, moving towards a weekly schedule again. So it'll be um, streamed on Wednesdays for the Patreon community and then released publicly on Friday, late Friday afternoon Pacific Standard Time. For any patrons of the community, I did yesterday publish a stream schedule from now until June, which is when the kids get out of school. Um, and there is a break for spring break, uh, which is at the end of March, because we're planning on hopefully getting away for at least a few nights. And I'm also going to be teaching at Fibers West. And I just need some space to be able to do that. We've got some house guests and it's just a little bit too crazy. It's so good to see you guys. Um, <clears throat> it's great to see... Uh, everybody in the chat. I'm just looking to see actually who's there. So hi to Kelly and Charlotte. Florence is here. Diane. Um, Meg. Eve, congratulations on your new wheel, Eve. She just got a uh, Magicraft rose. Congratulations. San is here. Um, I know it's Thursday in New Zealand, so welcome to those who are watching tomorrow, <laughs> which is just funny. Right before I did the live stream, because James is sort of feeling a little bit better today. He says today he's a 6 out of 10. Yesterday he was only a 4 out of 10, and the day before he was a 2 out of 10. So he's almost 8, for those who don't know. Um, I have two kids, um, a boy and a girl. And um, he told me right before we started the live stream that it was weird that him and Daddy could, because Mike's home today too, uh, could watch the live stream from the TV in the living room, in the family room while I was sitting here producing the show and then that was totally weird. <laughs> He's not wrong. <laughs> um, okay, you guys are talking about the weather. That's awesome. So yeah, that's great. I'm just catching up with the chat. I, you guys, because um, the live streams are a lot more busy than they were, say, a year ago when we first started this, um, I do find I have to take moments throughout the show to just have a look at chat, make sure that I'm catching up and um, making sure that I'm keeping on top of stuff. Maybe one day we'll have a little person sitting right here who moderates the chat with me, which would be really cool. So in today's show, we're going to have a brief discussion about our current breed and color study that's going on. We're currently studying organic polworth. And so I wanted to share two, one finished project and one finished yarn with you that was shared uh, by the community. And then I have a lot to chat about in terms of works in progress, which are all sitting right here. There's a little bit of a teaser here in the corner and um, a couple of uh, new spin, a, a new spin that I've got on the wheel that is part of a bigger project that I'm working on for the School of Sweet Georgia. So I thought we would spend the majority of the show talking about those things and kind of getting you up to date with where I'm at with my projects and some of my thinking around my projects for the new year. And some of the things that I'm working through right now, between now and March break, that I would like to have finished and so that I can move on to new projects in the spring and sort of start fresh almost. And then I have a little bit of uh, weaving to share with you that I started over the weekend because one of the things that I had mentioned on the show last week was that I was really hoping because uh, our first stream of the year was on New Year's Day on January 1st last week and that show has been released publicly. Uh, it was released a bit late because the scheduling in 
YouTube to make it public didn't I did something wrong and it didn't work so I'm sorry that there was a bit of a delay with episode 132 but I had mentioned in that show that one of my New Year's goals was to get both looms dressed by the New Year and so that actually happened on New Year's Day so I didn't it didn't happen before 2020 started but I did get it done on the first day of 2020 so it's pretty good and um yeah, we've got a giveaway going on right now in the Ravelry group. Anybody can join this. You do not need to be a patron of the show or a member of the community um, on Patreon. All you need to do is go into the January episode thread in the Ravelry group, and you just need to let us know what you learned in 2019. It can be something really complicated or something really simple. And that white bat right there, that one right there, I will send it out to whomever is drawn by the random number generator uh, the first show in February. For those who are part of the Attentive Spinner tier on Patreon, you guys are uh, the ones that are responsible for getting Wool and Spinning Radio, which is the audio podcast associated with the show. Because there's actually two podcasts. Wool and Spinning is actually two podcasts. We have the video cast that is part of what we do here with the live stream every week. But there's also a monthly audio podcast that is often published twice a month with a bonus episode halfway through the month. And patrons of the show, even if you only sign up and do a custom pledge for a dollar or two a month, get access to that audio podcast. And it's often conversations with me and my friend Katrina of Crafty Jack's Boutique, who's also our dyer for our breed and color studies. And a lot of you know Katrina from me talking about her and she's an active member of our community. Her... Um, her and I get together and chat and that generates one episode of Will and Spinning Radio uh, a month. But then we also have members from the community come on. So if you're part of the Attentive Spinner tier, you are invited to come on to Will and Spinning Radio with me. All you need is a microphone and a, and a pair of earbuds and you can plug into your phone and join me on Skype to chat. So there is a post I have linked it in the show notes and please do go ahead and sign up. And if the times don't work for you, let me know and we can adjust, okay? Okay, so without further ado, let's get into the show. Okay, so we're going to get straight into breed and color studies. I was just looking at the chat and um, um, I will answer your question in a sec, Eve, about what I'm wearing. Anyways, um, Kelly was saying that um, her and her husband met in BC, but they started a business in Edmonton over Victoria. And Eve says, oh, I hear Victoria is really expensive. So Victoria is the capital of British Columbia, for those who don't know um, a lot about this part of Canada. And um, it's on Vancouver Island. So you need to take a ferry or a float plane from Vancouver to get to Victoria or to get to Vancouver Island. And Vancouver Island itself um, is many different communities. And so there's just this chat going on about... Um, Victoria not being as expensive as Vancouver. So my brother and sister-in-law moved to Victoria three years ago. They find it way more expensive and they were living in downtown Vancouver. Um, so I don't know when you uh, lived there, Kelly, but Victoria is very expensive now. Gas is very expensive. Utilities are expensive. They pay a ton of house insurance. Um, they pay lots of property tax and they find their food because everything is brought in is really expensive. And so we were actually comparing side by side because they're accountants, <laughs> so they keep track of this stuff. Um, they've actually found their living expenses have gone significantly up. So yeah, I think it's definitely changed. And then of course you've got the cost of the ferries if you're going back and forth from the mainland to the island a lot. A lot of islanders stay on the island and they don't leave, but for those who have to go back and forth, it is quite expensive. The ferries just keep going up and up and up. So um, yeah, just just interesting stuff because Vancouver is very expensive. Don't get me wrong. We live in a suburb of Vancouver um, and my husband and I are very careful about um, um, how we kind of manage our stuff and we don't live right in Vancouver anymore. We lived in Vancouver for 10 years. My husband's from Toronto. Uh, so when he moved out here, he found it quite expensive out here and the wages are lower than in Ontario. Um, so that was a big change for us. But uh, yeah, so... Yeah, BC Hydro is more expensive for sure, electric and gas. But then you look at Ontario and their hydro is through the roof. So, 
yeah, it's crazy. Um, Eve is wondering what I'm wearing. So this is the Acer cardigan by Amy Christoffers. Um, I need to get a haircut. I knit this when I was pregnant with James in 2012, and um, it is still one of my most worn cardigans ever. And I think part of it is because it's not actually that, it's not too hot. Um, I knit it in Malabrigo Arroyo, which is a sport weight yarn, but I knit it at a higher gauge, so it's very, very loose. Um, the fabric is a little bit um, looser. It's not quite so tightly knit, and so I don't find it quite so warm. Because I do find with the live streams, because um, I've got all of the equipment in here plus two big lights on me and a light behind me. So I keep the fan on, which doesn't seem to cause a lot of noise on the microphone. Thank goodness, because I wouldn't be able to stay in here with everything. It's just too hot. <laughs> so uh, anyways, welcome to Jill. I'm glad you finally figured out how to get into the chat. And uh, it's good to see you, Sarah and Dana and uh, Kath. Yeah, it's so good to see everybody. Okay, so let's talk about breeding color studies. We're getting a little bit off topic because um, that's just kind of what we do here. <laughs> um, breeding color studies is something that we run in the community as part of sort of what we do here. You do not have to be a patron of the community to participate. Um, you do need to be a member of the Ravelry group so that you can keep up with the threads. Um, but you can purchase your own fiber, you can shop, shop from your stash and participate. You can dye your own fiber. Katrina and I do offer fiber that is dyed by Katrina and sold by Katrina so that people can participate and spin the same stuff, but it is certainly not a requirement. And that's something that we re try to reiterate as much as possible so that people feel really welcome to participate. Some people would prefer to do their breeding color studies from a raw fleece or from a washed fleece, and that is absolutely um, acceptable. We love it when people do that. The realities of doing that for our study on the scale that we do it is just not realistic. So we use, um, uh, commercially pre prepared fibers and many of you who've been around for a while and know sort of how these fibers um, respond because we're using non-superwash Katrina tries to source stuff that's not altered in any way chemically um, other than the dyes that she puts on it we're you know we're sort of as close to the the what the wool would be like if you had prepped it as we can, because um, we do have to be realistic. So Sarah, um, who on Ravelry is Sarah, Sonia, and in the chat today is Thornton. Um, I don't actually know how to say your last name, because I, I think it's Buenas, Buena, oh, Buena Sara? Buena Sara, oh, of course. Anyways, um, it always throws me off when I see Sarah and she knows this because Thornton was my dad's first name. So it always throws me off when I see her and I'm always so happy to see her there. Um, so Sarah, this was post number 70 in our ongoing thread in Ravelry about our current breeding color study, which I didn't mention runs from the beginning of October. And this one's actually gonna run until the end of June. Normally it would only run until the end of March, but um, we need to change the schedule for breeding color study a little bit to make it sustainable long-term. So more information will come on that in the spring. So Sarah, I have talked about Sarah's project on the podcast before, and she finished her shift cowl, which is, I'm just, I saw it and I just kind of stopped for a minute and was just blown away. I think it's absolutely beautiful. The yarns that she spun and the gradients that she created are just absolutely ideal for this pattern. It just worked out absolutely beautiful. So well done, Sarah, with your planning, because I know a lot of planning went into this to make your three yarns. So I'm going to read what she wrote. She she says, I pretty much posted all about my fun adventure in color on the Slack channel, but thought I would upload a final photo here. I love my shift cowl, and I know she's been wearing it a lot because she mentioned that in the Ravelry group and on the Slack channel. And also how I, oh wait, hang on. I love my shift cowl and the fiber and colors were just so wonderful to work with. I learned a lot about color and also how I like to work with it during this process, which I think is invaluable. In the finished cowl, there are many blips. There are tiny blips of blue or green in areas that aren't those colors because there were pieces of fiber with those colors on them when I was spinning. So what Sarah means there is on a given staple length of the Polworth, when she was drafting, if you look at that photo right now, actually at the top left-hand corner of her grid, there were staple lengths that had multiple colors on them. So when she was spinning, that meant that some of those colors blended and heathered into that section of yarn. So some of those staple lengths weren't completely clean in the color. And that's partially the length of the 
staple of the Polworth. It's the way that Katrina dyed it and the way that she put the color on. Um, the fact that Sarah was combining the white braid and the control colorway braid, which was the one that didn't have any white or brown added to it, that changed, uh, that meant that some of the color was on some of those staple lengths. And so she got that heathering throughout the yarn, which I think adds more interest and makes it a more interesting yarn. That's my personal um, preference. I decided to just leave those in the yarn and work them into the finished object and I like that they are there. To me it adds interest and also gives a quote proof of hand spun stamp uh, but in a really subtle way that adds to the flow of the colors in the fabric. I look forward to continuing to see what everyone else makes. I totally agree Sarah. So I asked her for some modeled photos and if she does uh, post some then um, hopefully she'll uh, share those with us. Uh, so the other one that I wanted to share was from Peggy, who's Kismet51 on post number 79. She did a two-ply fractal in her Graffiti Interrupted braid. So the Graffiti Interrupted is the one that was the white and the brown that was added. So the idea was to study sort of if these same colors are applied to a four-ounce braid in a different way, and we leave some white and we add some brown, how does that change the color? So um, Peggy says, I have finished spinning my graffiti interrupted. I'm very happy with the results. After much consideration, I decided to do a fractal spin, dividing the braid in half, spinning one half, then splitting the second half in two to spin. So she, so she split it lengthwise, and then she spun the one length end to end, and then she took the other length and she split that in half and spun each end to end. My second goal was to was a finer than my normal spin. This resulted in a lovely 574 meters of two ply yarn spun short forward worsted and she plans to knit a Rocky Mountaineer in this lovely light soft yarn. So beautiful Peggy, really, really well done. Gorgeous projects you guys. All right, so I wanted to very briefly talk about my make nine. So we talked about this all of on the wool stream yesterday um, which is a bi-monthly stream that we do um, that's sort of focused right now on capsule wardrobe and I'll just show you my make nine quickly so these are the projects that I'm hoping to make in in 2020 um, and the ones that I'm working on currently and I'm not going to go through all the details because we did talk at length yesterday on the wool stream about this um, Right now I am making the Copenhagen which is up top which I'll talk about today And I'm also currently working on the shifty which is the one right below it It just worked out that way that they lined up really nicely So these two are the ones that I'm working on right now the no frills, which is that kind of gold colored one in the middle of the grid, I am currently thinking about what fiber from my stash I would like to pull out and prep for that because I'm leaning towards one of the washed fleeces from the fleece auction back in June uh, that I talked about in the summer. Um, all those fleeces that I got with my friend Kelsey and my friend Diana, one of the long wools I'm leaning toward prepping for that cardigan because um, that's gonna be a lot of yarn. to spin and make. So let's talk about my shifty. All right. Yeah, it's definitely a learning curve, Kath, when you're uh, first learning how to kind of navigate the live stream. I think um, it looks really easy and it's not difficult. It's just getting used to it and getting used to the uh, uh, the change in format so and a slightly different format where you know at your end sort of technology wise you have to uh, uh, you know do something I have been working on this spin for my shifty for a while and this is West Coast color and this is my friend Lynn Anderson who is not only a fiber friend she is also one of my nursing mentors and anytime I'm having a nurse a nursing crisis which usually is some sort of existential crisis about nursing in general um, I always go to Lynn and part of it is because I know that she's gonna be honest and the other part of it is because I know that she's been there because like me she has a critical care background and so I've been working on this spin for quite a while and I finished it up yesterday while I was looking after James being homesick from school and then I came into the office 
and I was looking at the finished yarns and I was like, just doesn't really look like enough fiber. Like it just doesn't look like what I had for fiber. Like it just physically doesn't really look like that much. So guess what? I'm sure you guys can think of the answer. In one of my baskets, I found this yesterday. <laughs> so this is pretty consistent with what's been happening to me this fall. Um, I feel like I go three steps forward and one step back. So not as bad as two or five steps back, but I feel like I go kind of forward and back and forward and back. And I was looking at the yarns because they're all washed and finished and they poofed up just like Polworth does. And they've got a little bit of a sheen to them because it's Polworth and silk. It's 8515, I think. And um, it's really not as consistent as I would have liked it to be. These two skeins are actually very consistent with one another. And yes, I had a spinner's control card. And yes, I was looking at my consistency. And yes, I was checking my wraps print throughout the spin. But this fiber has been in my stash since 2014. And I think unfortunately, um, it's quite compacted as a result and it's been wrapped up quite tightly like this. And my friend Eve, um, who's in the chat right now, had the idea yesterday, she posted in the Slack channel about um, steaming it and then attenuating it to kind of get it to open up a bit. I think I'll try that for another project. I don't really want to do that for this one because I don't want to change the prep because I have all of this spun. So I also need to think about my time and my energy because I've got these other spins that I'm working on currently. So I think what I may do, I have my control card and I have all my stuff for this spin. I might put this aside. Um, I have a little tray over here that I keep my current spins in progress on. And I think what I'm going to do is put this on there and... Um, basically stare at it until I can get my wheel free again to be able to finish this up because I have like I said these deadline spins so this was my control card that I was working off of so this was the two ply that I was the unwashed two ply that I was plying to this was the three ply sample that I had done this is unwashed because my original plan was to three ply this yarn but because of the poof factor um, after I did some sampling this little mini sample here that I did I decided to go with a two ply because this poofed up so much because of the characteristics of Polworth that it ended up being sort of a wraps branch of 14, which is what I wanted in the finished three ply. And with everything going on this fall, to be honest with you, I just couldn't see myself spinning a really super fine three ply and sticking with it. I knew it would just end up getting stashed. So my singles ended up being here and I think I spun my singles to, um, well, I should look on my card, right? I think they were... ...21 wraps per inch, if my memory serves, to end up with a yarn that was 14 wraps per inch. And I was spinning on my Mazurecraft um, on my Suzy Pro. And one of the things that I've really, that I can really see about these three yarns is this one ended up quite a bit lighter. So even though I had multiple bobbins that I was plying from to try to mix the colors up as much as possible, this definitely ended up slightly darker and this ended up slightly lighter. So like my Copenhagen, which I'll talk about in a minute, I'm knitting this two by two. So two rows of one from one skein and two rows from the other. And I may end up doing that for this as well when I go to use it because It'll just mix up the colors. It'll limit some of the striping that you see in the initial swatch, which I love. I love this swatch so much, um, which is part of the reason why I'm thinking about possibly pivoting and changing directions with this sweater. Um, this was knit on four millimeter needles and I just love it so much. That is so reassuring for us mere mortals. Yes, yes, I am only human. Um, so I don't know how much my yardage is, but you can really see because this was this was the one that was from the fiber that was so compacted. So I'll just uh, move these out of the way because these two actually were fine. It was the last... Oh, I'm going to end up dropping a bunch of stuff. It was the last little bit of fiber that I spun that ended up being this yarn that was quite compacted. And you can see how uneven my spinning is. And then the plying wasn't as tight as it could have been as a result. Like the plying should have been more like this. 
and instead it was sort of more like that. So when it knits up, it's actually fine, but I think I probably need to put this skein back through the wheel and reply it to tighten it up because it is quite inconsistent. Um, I know some of you are probably thinking, no, you're being overly critical, but honestly, it's really inconsistent. Um, even James was like, mommy, that's very bubbly yarn. <laughs> Thanks, James. <laughs> I appreciate you too. <laughs> so, oh, welcome, Barbara. Good to see you. Welcome to your first chat. So I, um, I think probably what I'll do is I'll, when I get to the point where I can re, where I can actually spin this, um, at, when I go to ply that at the same time, I'll put this back through the wheel and tighten it up and m have it match a bit better to this one because then they'll be a little bit more, more close, um, in terms of like the twist angle and, and just their general yarniness. So from the sample here, because I loved this so much, this yarn in this project has been to spin for the shifty by Andrea Mowry, which is a pullover. And it uses the same pattern as the shift cowl, the shifty cowl, which I think was the first pattern in this series of patterns. Like I think it was the shifty cowl, the shift sweater or the shifty sweater, sorry. And then she brought out the night shift, which is the big triangular shawl, but it all uses the same stitch pattern. So I had bought the patterns back when they, when, I, when we were getting ready for our trip to the Yukon, um, because I wasn't sure if I would get some sampling done and some swatching and stuff done. And I wanted to play around with possibly using the Dorset study for the shift cowl. And it just didn't work because the yarns weren't high enough contrast. So yesterday, because of James being home, I sat down and did some swatching. So this is knit on 3.75 millimeter needles because I misread the pattern and the pattern is actually knit, the body is knit on 3.5 millimeter needles. And I'm sorry, I don't know off the top of my head what that is in US sizing. I can check really quickly. And Oh, I'll answer your question in just a sec, Katie. So US five millimeter needles is what this swatch is knit on, so 3.75, and 3.5 millimeter needles is what I sh probably should have swatched on. And I can see based on the fabric, because it's quite loose, um, and it's it's got holes in it, you probably can't see, but I can see through it, like I can see the camera. Um, I think that I would want it to be a little bit denser and the other thing that was really interesting was you can see through this area here, right in here, because of the amount of barber pulling and the skein of yarn that I pulled from my stash to try with it, which was this one, and it happened to be at a point where it was really super barber pulled with very similar colors, you completely lose the nature of the underlying pattern. So the parts of this swatch that worked the best we're actually this up here, where the yarn is a little bit more solid, um, my West Coast color, uh, background color, and my, and this yarn here, which was a three ply fractal that I spun, it was part of the Sweet Georgia Club colorway um, in 2016, I think, and it was the colorway Equinox. And this was another club colorway, it was from June of 2017 called glamping and I was just going through my stash looking for some really stereotypical hand spun preferably two ply although this is three ply um so two ply hand spun and from hand painted braids I can remember what the third piece was so this one worked really well um and that's these first four sections up here. That worked really beautifully. I, I quite like this. So after I had knit this, I was like, oh, I this is working. This I, I like this. And then I did the first little bit of the Equinox here, which is this, or sorry, the glamping, which is this one here. And it, it continued to work until I got into the real barber polling. 
And I think if I was knitting the sweater at this point, I think I maybe would have thought about cutting out some of that yarn and not using it. And then I just wanted to see what would happen if I used some yarns from my stash that were a little bit atypical. So this was hand pulled roving off of my drum carter. It was another Sweet Georgia Club colorway. And I can't actually remember what it was called because I didn't write it down. These are the colors here. But it actually didn't work and I'll show you why. So if you look at the swatch, it's quite uniform and quite square. Here, I'll turn it so you guys can really see it. Up until about here. And these, this last bit, you see how much it flares out and it loses its shape. The gauge increases. See how the stitches come way out here and way out here. Um, the reason for that is because the gauge of the yarn was wrong. So this yarn is more like a wraps print of like 11 and all of this yarn so this yarn, this yarn, this yarn, it's all a wraps per inch of 14. So just that little bit uh, bigger gauge really changed the fabric and you can see how bubbly it is and it just doesn't really work. I was going to take some hand painted comb top out of my stash to spin to use as the other colorways for this sweater. But one of the things I talked about in the wool stream yesterday was this idea of really hoping and wanting to try to use some of my hand spun sash. And these two yarns, the yardage of them is way too much for what is called for in the pattern. I think in the pattern it calls for 200 yards one skein each of three different colors. And like this one alone is well over 400 yards. So I might actually be able to get away with just using these two and sort of alternating them back and forth and blending them a little bit more than doing sections like she does in the cardigan. So I'll report back because I'm not totally sure what I'm gonna do and how I'm gonna proceed because I feel really torn about it. And I'm just going to see, I know there's a whole bunch of questions I haven't found Eve that long wool loses its shape like alpaca or silk does. That certainly has not been my um, experience. The only thing is it can be heavy. So that's why I'm a bit torn about what I wanna use. I have a Cotswold fleece. So I was gonna do some sampling and I was thinking about spinning short backward and not smoothing so that like that no frills cardigan, it's a little bit fuzzy and gives that mohair effect without actually the heaviness of mohair. So that's sort of what I've been thinking. Um, thank you for your kind words about the yarn. I, I am really happy with this yarn. I just um, wish that it was, that I had spun it sooner and that, that it was a little bit more consistent and hadn't become so compacted in my, in my stash. That was definitely my fault because I wasn't really, well, I think the thing is we amass so much stash and then stuff slowly gets pushed to the back and we, we forget about it or we don't use it. And then all of a sudden, you know, we, stuff starts to break down, it can get ruined. Um, I know we've had people in the group that have had um, insects. I just realized there's this part of this yarn that, oh, it's a slub. I was like, this part of the yarn is like, it looks like it's falling apart, but it's a slub. That's so funny. When you reply a yarn, do you use the same wheel ratio as the original ply? You know, Kathy, it really, or Katie, sorry, it really depends. When I'm replying a yarn, pre pretty much anything that I work on, I don't worry too much about what the whirl is or what the ratio is, unless it's too high or too low. But if it's somewhere in the middle, you know, nine to one, 11 to one, 12 to one, 15 to one, sort of anything in there, sort of 12 to 15, um, I'll just start putting it back through because I'm not concerned quite so much with how much twist I'm adding and how many treadles per inch or, you know, how much twist per inch I'm matching. What my concern is, is I'm actually matching another yarn. So the twist angle on this is about 35 degrees and it needs to be closer to 40 to 45 degrees. So what I'll be looking for when I'm replying is that that twist angle goes from down here up to here so that once it goes for its second bath and gets washed again, 
it'll relax a bit and end up with a twist angle that's much closer to what this yarn was. And I think what happened was this wasn't really super consistently spun. I was plying it when I was sick. The kids are sick. Mike is sick. And I think I just went on to autopilot and I just started feeding it through the wheel, not realizing that I wasn't putting enough twist in. And the result is an ever, it, it, the yarn is plied totally fine. If I wasn't also matching it to these two skeins, which are plied to my samples, which was a twist angle more of like 40 to 45 degrees. And this is a twist angle of more like 35 to 40 degrees. So I just need to tighten it up a bit. And I don't need to really worry about what the ratio is per se. Um, I'll just watch the yarn and make sure that it's tightening up enough for what I want and what I'm looking for. Does that make sense? Does that help? You want to be careful about adding too much twist for sure. You'll find that when you're plying, it's actually, I, I find in my experience, it's really hard to push your yarns beyond a certain point. Like if your yarns are going to a twist angle that's like upright like this, you'll find that it's harder and harder to put twist into it and it just becomes so curly Q and so overspun and over twisted that as you're spinning, it just becomes more and more and more difficult. So I don't worry too, too much about the about that so much I worry I, I I really watch that twist angle and making sure that I get it tightened up to where I want it I think we forget and I do this all the time so I'm I'm not um I'm making a blanket statement based on my experience but I know others have said the same thing um I find that it actually is quite amazing how much twist we need to really get things high twist like this right now is sort of a medium to low twist it's about 35 degrees um it's it's soft spun it's not a, it's not a hard yarn at all it's very soft I could probably break it just by gently tugging on it it's just not quite high enough twist enough but if you add like you have to add quite a bit of twist for for that twist angle to really tighten up like I've twisted it a, a number of times and I'm only up to there and it's not even curly Q yet. Like it, it's folding back on itself, but not unpleasantly so. So then if I wanna keep going, like that's a, a lot more twist. Like it's really not until you start to get to this point, and I, I can't even hold it properly, where you're starting to get, that's over plied. But if you relax back a little bit to about here, that's way more what I'm looking for and a plyback that's a perfect chain-like interlinked cabled yarn. That's what I'm looking for. And then when it hits the water, it will end up, because I sampled, looking like this. Does that make sense? Is that helpful? Maybe that's not helpful. <laughs> okay, there's a whole bunch of chat. So, <clears throat> I think one of the things, anytime anybody posts in the Ravelry group or on the Slack channel questions about what they're spinning, fiber that they're thinking about, um, projects that they're thinking about, whether it's knitted or woven, uh, crocheted, whatever, if you're not sampling, you don't know how the fibers are going to act and you don't know how your yarns are going to act and you don't realize how much twist our yarns can take and I talk I will be talking about this later this month in my exploration of the breeding color studies um, because those yarns are going to go my yarns for the breeding color studies are going to go on the floor loom and so they need quite a bit of twist to withstand the tension of a floor loom and I I talk about so what I was looking for in that twist angle and in the vlog it's the how I spin vlog and um, that's the the way to sort of figure that out and sort of get to that point is to sample you know and Polworth is a finer fleece um, some people classify it as medium some people call it a fine some people don't agree that there is a medium classification of wool um, sometimes I'm actually inclined to agree because a lot of these fibers that are raised for these sheep that are raised for fiber they do, they are raised for fineness and for softness. And so like Polworth is a great example. It's longer stapled than Merino, um, but it's still fine. And it's got a lot of crimp. And because of that crimp, it can take a lot of twist. And a lot of that excess twist, it will dissipate in the water. So as long as you're not pushing your yarns to the point of being like what I just showed you, where they're so over twisted that they're like unreasonable, 
you know, I think we we don't sometimes realize, especially as newer spinners, um, how much twist we can put into our yarns, and res- and the results are really lovely knitting yarns, like really lovely compared to commercial yarns that are soft spun singles, meet you know low low twist. Like this is way more hard wearing, stretchy, elastic. It has memory um, compared to a yarn um, that I maybe would have bought it at my local yarn shop. So, yeah, a lot of people do tre- count treadles, and I used to. Um, I find with the amount of teaching that I do and the amount of ch- chatter that I that I engage in in the podcast, I um, I've kind of gotten away from some of it because I find sometimes like it's just it gets really super technical for for a lot of people. But if I want to be absolutely bang on with my yarns and I want them to be absolutely perfect and I'm working on something that's really, really, really special to me and I want it to be sort of have a certain aesthetic or I'm working on a yarn that is for like the 51 yarns spin along uh, like the boucle that we did. I was very technical with that yarn when I was making it to make sure that I was putting in enough twist. I think more often than not, people actually don't put enough twist into their yarns. And I see that over and over and over again. Um, So if you think that you might be one of those people, see what happens if you hold your yarn in front of your wheel out from the orifice for a bit longer and add more twist. See what happens. Let it run onto the bobbin and then pull it off and do a plyback test and see what you think because you might be surprised and you might really like the results. So, or do what I did with this spin. I took about, I think this ended up being about seven, maybe nine, maybe nine, probably seven um, grams of fiber that were spun singles and I did a little um, two ply and um, And I knit with it just to see, I washed it, I finished it just like I would, and then I did that uh, knitted swatch so that I sort of had an idea of where I was going. Um, You know, you can never go wrong with sampling, ever, ever, ever. I know if you do a, any kind of a um, spinning certificate or a master spinner program, um, they want you to count your treadles and whatnot. And I think as you advance in your spinning education and as you become a more, advanced intermediate advanced spinner i definitely think it's something that you need to take the time to learn because um you won't go you can't go wrong with it and then you can always go back to it if you want so here are some of my other yarns that i pulled out to try for my shifty um i really like this one this is a combo spin that i did and i did a woven wrap with some of it but i still have two skeins of it and i really liked it but i wasn't sure if it was enough contrast And then the other one was this one here that I really liked. This was a, uh, they're not dying anymore and I can't remember the company. Um, They were one of the really coveted indie dyers from back in the, um, around like 2010, 2007. Um, That's a lovely contrast. My only concern was this is BFL silk and it's got a bit of a fuzz to it. And I wasn't sure, and it's a little bit denser. I spun it during Spinzilla one year and I didn't spin it as finely as I wanted to. So it's a little bit thicker, but I did really like these two next to each other. And I thought that this one actually coordinated in quite nicely. So I don't, I'm not, I'm not totally sure. Cause the green, uh, I don't know. So then I had another idea and just let me switch my cameras around here just for a moment. I'm going to take this away. And what I was actually thinking, and because we're having such a quiet day today and everybody's sick, I was actually thinking about possibly using my fin study yarn and doing some swatching. My concern, and I, if there's anybody in the community um, who has done, who has made a shift, a shifty sweater, if you could let me know how much you actually used of your secondary yarn, because this these two are the combo spun skeins, and I have more than enough for the shifty sweater. And then these were the three accents. So it was Arctic Berries, Fractured Dawn, and Lakeside is the far one, that, that red and green one. 
but I have roughly 140 to 150 yards of each. But in the pattern, she calls for one skein of 200 yards of each. So my question is whether or not that would be enough yardage for all of the colors. And I think probably the answer is no, but I have so much yardage of these ones that maybe I could work them in as part of the sweater. Do you know what I mean? So that they become, so it's more textured than it is about the colors. Because this yarn is currently hanging on a branch in our dining room. And I have to admit, I would really like to use it. I would like to have it featured in something and have it knit up into something. And uh, I was looking at this the other day and kind of wondering if maybe this yarn would work. I'm just not sure about the yardage. And I don't really want to spin up more of it. I would like to use what I spun and sort of leave it at that. It's a top-down cropped sweater, and the yardage is not much. Um, you don't need a ton of yardage for this sweater, so that's a great question, Rebecca. The problem is that because it's sort of, if you look at Sarah's, um, if you look at Sarah's, if you look at her shift cowl here, you see how there's sort of like those chunks of stripes? So it's like the red and the peach, and then it goes to the peach, peachy, yellowy orange with a, light, a darker peach, and then there's the different colors of the blue, and then she goes to the yellow and green. So you see how there's like those stripes in there? That's how the, car, the sweater is as well. So you move through sort of the yoke is two colors, the main color, and then one of the um, other skeins, and then so on and down the sweater. So anyways, it, I'm just torn about what to do. And um, if anybody's made it, I would love to hear your thoughts on the episode thread in Ravelry about what you found worked really well for your sweater. Because working from hand spun can be a little bit challenging because you know you do all this knitting and then you get to the end and you're like, mm, I don't know if I really like that. So it's a little bit of a leap of faith for sure. I'm not feeling very leap of faithy right now. <laughs> So we'll talk about my hyssop really quickly. This is from the Knitting uh, to, to the Point Knitting Triangles by Layla Raven. Oh, take care, Wendy. It's good to see you. Um, I have actually finally finished the body of this. So I'll make the, the um, screen big because I know that it is a little bit bigger, a little bit better to see this from the main camera. So I'll hold this up, it's absolutely massive. So I finished the body of the, of the shawl. It's a triangle shawl. You work it from the bottom point and you work your way up, increasing on every row. And now I'm at the very top. And to be honest with you, I just, I just couldn't keep going. I was like, I'm just, I'm done. I need to not be doing this, this lace anymore. And so now I'm at the top and I'm doing the top garter stitch. So you do some increases in those garter stitch rows at the top. And I think in the pattern she only has four or five garter ridges, but I'm going to I'm going to double that if not more than double it to make it a little bit thicker for my finer gauge. So the pattern is in an Aran weight yarn and this is a sport weight yarn and I'm knitting this on four millimeter needles and the pattern is knit on five and a half millimeter needles. So I've had to just sort of make changes along the way which we've talked about quite a bit on the show so I won't go into all the details um because I'm feeling very wordy today and um so I'm going to keep working at the top here do the increases where I'm supposed to it's just blowing out because it's having trouble reading the darkness and the lightness so I will finish that up and then you cast off this upper edge and then you pick up the other two edges and do some increases and then you cast off so I'm hoping that by next week I'll have finished the top part of the shawl, the garter at the top, and I can actually hold it out and show it to you guys. And then I'll be able to cast on, pick up the bottom part. So it's turning out really nicely. I'm really, really happy with it. Um, the yarn is very dark. We've talked about this on the podcast before. It's very difficult for the camera to pick it up. But that's probably pretty accurate there. And you can see the wrap stitches there. I've shown the pattern in the shawl on the show quite a few times so I won't I won't go into it again here but I'm looking forward to having this done this is a wool it was a merino alpaca blend fiber blend that I did a review for it was from Kramer yarns it's actually still available the roving it's in a whole bunch of different colors 
the one that they sent me for review several, several years ago uh, was, I think it was back in like 2015, 2016, I did the review. Um, I had rose gold and then I over dyed the fiber with logwood because I had done a course at my and I wanted to see what the gray would look like by throwing it over top. And that was um, some of my favorite yarn. I had knit it up into a vest. I never wore the vest, so I ripped it out. And I'm re-knitting it into the shawl to reclaim the yarn because it's some of my favorite yarn that I've ever made. So um, sometimes it's worth it to do that. I haven't made a lot of progress on my Copenhagen, but I will share it with you for those who missed the show last week. Um, this is the Falkland yarn that I spun through the fall. It was inspired by a sample that my friend Mari and I had seen at Knit City back in October. And I am alternating skeins because again, like the West Coast color, sorry for the crinkling, um, they're slightly, every single skein is slightly different. So I'm going two by two, so two rows, and you knit the button band at the same time. Everything's tangled from me taking it in and out of my in and out of my bag. So um, you're knitting the button band at the same time, and then you do um, afterthought buttonholes afterward. And um, I'm knitting on four millimeter needles as well. I think there's a theme here. Everything right now is on four millimeter needles, because I almost swatched the shifty on four millimeters too, and then I realized that that wasn't what was called for, because it's just that little bit finer gauge, you know. So that's uh, turning out really well. And I'm holding Farmer's Daughter yarns, Farmer's Daughter fibers um, with it, which is a 70% uh, uh, kid mohair, 30% silk blend. And it's in the colorway Warm Melted Butter. And it looks like this. So that uh, was sort of the closest thing that I could find at Fibers West that matched the colors in the fiber from Lynn. And the nice thing is, is that it's really creating a certain sense of homogeny in the knit fabric um, because I did want it to be overall sort of uh, not too stripy and not too tonal. But thus far, I'm actually quite happy with it. I wasn't sure when I first cast it on, I was a little bit skeptical about whether or not I kind of liked what it was creating, but I'm quite happy with it now. And I'm finished the short rows at the, for the back neck. And um, I'm just working my way down the front. So that's it there. I did finally wash my swatch, which I seem to have misplaced. All this moving around today. And uh, I actually really like how it washed up. Um, as you guys can tell, I'm not su a super stickler for, swatch for swatching since I've already cast on for the sweater. Um, sw I have a love-hate relationship with swatching. We can get into that in another show because <clears throat> I can feel myself losing my voice. Um, but this really, it bloomed quite a bit and the drape is lovely. It really, I'm really happy with, with how this finished up. So um, I washed it and dried it yesterday and it's, it's just really soft and has a lovely feel, lovely drape from the mohair and silk. So that's nice to have some mindless knitting. Um, I, unfortunately, I now have two projects that are mindless knitting because I've got the stockinette body of that sweater to get through. And then I also have all that garter stitch of the hyssop. So it's a lot of mindless, you know, knit, 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 knit. So I'm hoping that it doesn't get too onerous. It does go with my hair, doesn't it? Somebody said to me the other day, actually, that they think my hair is changing color again. And the funny thing is, is Mike was actually commenting on it. And he thought that my hair was actually getting a bit brighter again. But I don't think it is. I think it's actually getting a bit darker. The funny thing is, um, it's getting thicker, which is nice. Um, but the longer it gets, of course, the sort of, it just hangs. But I have about an inch left before I can donate it again. And then I'll cut it up to here. Um, and that'll sort of bring some of the life back into it. So I'm getting my hair cut, just trimmed tomorrow. But I had, yeah, it was somebody at work. It was sort of like one of those offhand comments. Like it was a little bit mean, you know? And I was sort of like, okay, I don't know if I should take that, like how I should take that. I'm not, I'm not totally sure. Anyways, because I'm lucky to be almost 40 and um, still have my red. Because um, usually by now it's, it's faded or gone. This is an alpaca merino silk blend. And those who followed the podcast for a while 
know that I am sensitive to alpaca. I don't work with it very often because it gives me the sneezes. And I don't like break out into a rash or anything, but I get very sneezy and very allergic. Not like a full-blown allergy, but just, you know, sniffly. But this was part of a series of fibers that were dyed by Sweet Georgia back in the fall for the Spin Together Week that was hosted in the UK. And um, this is the second of the three braids. So I shared with you back um, over Christmas about the disaf spinning experiment that I'm doing in the Gotland. And actually the only reason why I haven't talked about it again on the podcast is because I kind of had to put it aside for a couple of weeks because my lendrum was being used for something else, i.e., Applying. And so I started on this one because I have three of these to spin. So I have the merino, so the alpaca merino silk to spin. I have the Gotland to spin, and then there's also 100% Targi. And they all feature the colorway falling leaves. So it's all the same dyes, same colors, same sequence of colors. And um, this is going to be for a uh, weaving with color workshop on the School of Sweet Georgia. So I started s- spinning this. Um, on Monday I think because I needed something quiet to work on in the in the family room with James being so sick and I really wanted to get started on it so I took the braid and I I didn't do like a sample per se but I was um sort of working with like I was going to pull it off the wheel but then I thought no I'll just leave it for a moment um I sort of started like stripping the braid And the more I stripped it, the more it sort of started to like drift apart and kind of fall apart. It just didn't keep its shape really super nicely. And then when I went to pre-draft it, it just started to fall apart. Sorry, I'm not in the camera. It just started to kind of fall apart. So the more I stripped it and the more I attenuated it, um, it just, and I think it's just all the different fibers in this blend. So what's been working the best is leaving it a little bit thicker. So I only stripped it so that I had six bundles of fiber and then very very gently adding a little bit of a twist and which is a trick that I learned from my friend Kim McKenna and just very gently attenuating it very very gently and then I'm my hands because of the staple length of the fiber I've had to keep my hands a little bit closer together than I normally would holding my fiber supply very lightly very gently and just you know, pinching, draw back like half an inch, three quarters of an inch, and then smoothing, draw back, smooth, draw back, smooth. So very, very short, but keeping my back hand very, very light and not holding onto the fiber too tightly. <clears throat> because I'm finding as soon as I hold onto it really tightly, the fibers, A, don't want to draft very nicely. B, um, my yarn immediately becomes thicker and I'm drafting too many fibers. And also, I lose some of that. Because I'm spinning a little bit finer and worsted style where I'm smoothing it, um, if if I really am holding on to the back yarn, it, be, it just immediately becomes inconsistent because it's like, you know, pull back, you know, slide my hands and it's like one length and then draft back and you're like really reefing on the fiber. So those are sort of the three reasons. And um, keeping the my, my backhand really, really light and very, very, very gentle. I just keep thinking light and airy, light and airy. Um, I can, you know, very gently sort of draft forward and smooth and draft forward and smooth and just keep it a little bit finer. So I, I, I hope that I can move my webcam just a little bit to show it to you on the wheel. We'll see how this goes. Da, 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 da. I'm not sure if this is going to work or not, but we'll see. See a little bit of the behind the scenes. So that's it on the wheel there. So this is the fiber. And I've just, just like I said, just been pre-attenuating it just a little tiny bit and adding a little bit of a twist to it to keep it together because I find it's just, it just falls apart immediately otherwise. And then I've got it on the wheel here. And this is the third bump. I was really hoping I could have it finished for the live stream. And um, I just kind of ran out of time. This is all I have left. 
of this third bump and that'll be the conclusion of the first bobbin and then I'll do the second bobbin I'm doing a two ply and I'll be able to apply it so I am going to rewind these singles because I've been spinning them worsted so you know drafting back very gently like I said smoothing the singles and then you know repeating and keeping my drafting length very short the merino I think the combination of the marine of the merino the cut silk it's not probably enough fiber to show you and the alpaca just sort of has resulted in a variety of fibers in this comb, in this comb top in this commercial prep that just aren't very long so it's sort of from there to there it's not that long so if you're drafting only half of that you know that's only an inch at best and I'm spinning quite fine, so it'll finish up. Um, I want these yarns to finish up sort of around a wraps print of between 14 and 16, and they're gonna be woven with, like I mentioned. So lots of twist will go into them. My plyback test is quite tight. And the nice thing about the alpaca and the silk blend is there's quite a bit of sheen. It's just a lovely, lovely yarn. It's gonna have a really nice drape. I'm interested to see the drape of the Gotland and the drape of the of this blend. And then you throw the Targi in there, which doesn't really have any drape. It's more like Polworth. It's poofy and springy and, you know, it hits the water and it, you know, bounces. It'll be really interesting to see how that weaves up next to these two yarns and how that sort of combination works out all three of these yarns are going to be a two ply and they're all going to be sort of moderately to high moderate to high twist the gotland is going to be close to medium twist because it just doesn't need as much twist it's so long long stapled yeah you do you totally can see the sheen can't you from the because there's a big light up there and it's shining right on the wheel isn't that lovely so Actually, this morning when I was spinning away, because I've just hit a part that's where there's a lot of peach and a lot of this rust, kind of peachy, orangey rust color. But for a bit there, it was like the mauve purple, the tealy, uh, soft, this color. And then the gold and the peachy rust. And it just, the bobbin was absolutely beautiful. So, but I'm past that point now. So you didn't get to see that, unfortunately. The texture is going to be really interesting. You're absolutely right, Rebecca. The other um, thing that I wanted to mention about this as well was I was going to spin. Oh, there's floof, floof floating by me. I was going to spin all of six of these nests to one bobbin, and then I was going to do a center pull ball, but I actually decided not to because I thought, you know, center pull balls when you pull the center yarn out so a center pull ball you literally do just that you wind a center pull ball and you pull from the outside and you pull from the inside but the singles that's coming out of the inside is taking on more twist as it un untwists itself as it unravels from the center of the ball compared to the outside that's traveling more slowly and not taking on as much twist if you want to see this in like personified there's a great graphic uh, it's a photograph that Jillian Moreno did on the Nitty Spin blog, I think if my memory serves, or it might be on her own personal blog. And it was actually of her um, measuring tape wrapped up in a, in a coil. And then she pulled the two ends. And you can see how much twist the center takes on compared to the outside. And I just thought, you know, we're trying to minimize um, some of those extraneous factors for this project and for talking about it on the School of Sweet Georgia. And I don't want to mislead people by throwing in something like a center pole ball. And the other thing is I'm working so hard to keep that sheen of the underlying fibers, of the, the characteristics of the fiber, by spinning it worsted. Even though I'm doing short backwards, there's a little bit more air that's left in and it's not quite as consistent. It's a little bit fuzzier than it would be if it was short forward. But um, I thought it was probably advantageous to rewind the singles to the first spun end and ply from the first spun end if I'm going to all of that effort. So that's what I'm going to do. So the second bobbin will be these three nests. And then I'll rewind the singles and I'll ply. Oh, the fiber is merino. It's alpaca merino silk. 
Um, and actually it's 50% alpaca, 30% merino, 20% silk. So it's quite a high silk content actually. Yeah, the webcam's having trouble focusing. So I'll maybe back off just a little bit and see if that helps. So before we say goodbye, does anybody have any questions about anything that we talked about today? Because it's um, we're just over an hour, so I am going to say goodbye. And I am losing my voice, so I need to go and rest. <clears throat> I don't feel too badly. It's just the stupid throat and my voice. Go figure. I agree, Tiffany. Uh, she says that she notices that the texture of a two-ply made from a center pole is never as nice as a traditional. I agree. And we use center pole balls in our in the book, Unbraided, because a lot of people do use... Um, center pole balls as an a, a plying technique and they use it a lot and there are some people that only do center pole balls and there's nothing inherently wrong with that you just need to know what the shortcomings are like with any choice that you make in your spinning um, so that's why we had included it as one of the ways to ply your yarns so yeah it is totally the added twist of one of the singles that's absolutely what it is yeah Yeah, fine high twist singles plied from a center pole ball. You are asking for trouble. <laughs> I have been in that situation and been fighting with the fiber and fighting with the yarn and wondering why in the tarnation I did it to myself. Um, one of these was actually spun from a center pole ball because I didn't think that I had any fiber left. And so this little skein here was actually spun from a center pole, but it's actually not too bad. It's pretty consistent. Um, for the plying it's not it's not too bad so all right if there are any other questions you guys can ask now otherwise I will talk to you next week I am hoping to have a finished yarn to share with you hopefully this will be done and hopefully the Gotland will be back on the wheel I'm also hoping to have some more sampling done for the shifty sweater and some decisions to be made. You know, I'm really leaning towards using this for something else. And um, the more I talk about it on the podcast, the more that I kind of vacillate about it, the more I kind of am leaning towards using this yarn for something else. I just absolutely love these colors so much. And um, they're colors that I wear a lot. And because I found this extra fiber, because hello, um, I actually was wondering about, you know, finding a silk and mohair like the one that I'm using for the Copenhagen and matching it to this to create some homogeny with the yarn and fuzzy stitches. And if I have enough yardage, maybe this will become the no frills cardigan. I don't know. We will see. So I will keep you posted on that. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about my weaving today. So I'll just show you really quickly what's on the loom and then we're going to move along. This is a uh, hound's tooth. So it's four by four four warp threads, four warp threads, and four weft threads, and it creates this hound's tooth design. This is on my jack loom, on my floor loom, and I've this is actually the beginning of the second towel. I've already finished the first one, and I'm really enjoying it. It's uh, basically 2 2 twill. These were the original warp chains, and yes, they are for Christmas for ne next year, and yes, the warp is inordinately long so that I can get off quite a few Christmas gifts that I'm going to put away for next year. So that is what I'm working on right now. And I also have the other one that I shared last show with you. I'm still working on it. I actually finished the first towel and I'm halfway through the second. So my rule, because these are going so fast because you're carrying the floats up the side, which you can see in this photo here, and it just makes a lovely, lovely pico edge. The other one, I have to cut the warp threads every single time. And so my rule is that I can't make a towel on the red and white or red and natural red and cream until I finish a towel of the other one. So for every towel that I finish of the rainbow, I can make a towel of this one because I can whip off a towel on this one in about an about an hour whereas the other one it's like quite a few hours. So I do one towel on the other one on the compact and then I can come to the jack loom the floor loom my 45 inch and whip off one of these and then I have to go back to my my compact and do a towel on there so that's kind of my rule to get those other ones done because I can see what will happen is I just I won't work on them and I need that loom 
for my breeding color studies project. So I need to keep working on the other warp to get it done. And if you're curious about what's on the compact, I shared that with you last show. And if you look in the video description on YouTube down below the video itself, there's timestamps and you can go forward and it's all linked there and you can click on the link and it'll take you to that part of the podcast. Yes, I am getting ahead on my Christmas gifts for next year. And the only reason is because everything went to, excuse my language, hell in a handbasket this year for gifts and planning and all that kind of stuff. And um, um, I just thought, you know what, I'm going to do something different for 2020 because I really want to give away Christmas tea towels. And I'm gonna if I don't get them on the loom right away, I'm not going to do it. It'll be November and I still won't have done it. So that is what I'm working on. All right, if you guys have any final questions, I don't think so. I had asked you guys, are you carrying the colors up the side? I am carrying the colors on this one. The other one I'm putting the ends in. So it's a little bit different. Um, I am weaving around it. I think that photo doesn't really show it very well. Um, it's just the way on that one that I took the photo because I was doing some sampling at the beginning and so that photo doesn't show. The, the cream ended up carrying up in the wrong way. I'll see if I can get a better photo for next show. So yeah, I did say, yeah, it is 8-2 cotton and it's uh, caudalin. The cream is caudalin in just natural and the red is, shoot, I had to figure it out because I ran out and I had to get a spool from Katrina and now I can't remember what the color was called. It's kind of like a cranberry color. I'll try and find out for you, Charlotte. Question, can you finagle a hound's tooth on a rigid heddle? I think that you can. I think you have to use pickup sticks. Oh, no, no, no. No, you don't. Um, hound's tooth is just 2 2 12. So the way that you create the hound's tooth design is by changing your weft every four picks. So your weft becomes, if you've got four picks in your warp, sorry, four ends in your warp and four picks in your weft, that's what creates it. So it's just two, two, twelve, um, and you're just going through, you know, treadle one. Well, it depends if you have it set up as a walking treadle. So I'm not going to go into that. But basically, it's just four and four. So yes, you can do it on a rigid treadle. Yeah, it's just color and weave. Absolutely, Megan. Yeah, yeah, Caudalyn's lovely, isn't it? It just makes the best tea towels. So I never thought about weaving tea towels. Oh, that's so funny, Kath, because that's like all I've done. <laughs> I've done a few other things, obviously, and I've done some some hand spun, hand hand woven stoles and stuff. But I, the reason why I wanted to weave on a floor loom was to make tea towels. So, hopefully, that'll kind of satisfy my my tea towel obsession for a bit when I get these two warps finished, and then I can move on <laughs> to other things because I've got these these hand spun, hand woven projects I need to go on next. So. Okay, we will just keep on talking and I am very cognizant of keeping you and keeping your time. So thank you so much to those who are here and who are participating. How far does one cone of cotton go? I, uh, I'm not, I don't think I can answer that because um, these were, I started with cones that weren't completely finished, weren't completely full because they were from other projects. So I'm not sure I'm the right person to ask. Um, yeah. I'm just catching up with chat. All right. So have an awesome day. Happy spinning. Happy knitting. Happy weaving. Happy all the things. I will see you guys next week. Same time, same place. And um, the show will be released publicly on Friday evening. And if you would like to learn more about supporting the show and getting in on the live streams, please check out patreon.com slash welfare pearls. Until next time. Bye guys.